Welcome to Expanding Space, Newsweek's deep dive into the cosmos, from the moon to Mars and beyond. Featuring insight from top experts, scientists, and former astronauts, Expanding Space will push the boundaries of what we know and what we have yet to discover. I'm Joshua Rett Miller, Chief Investigative Reporter here at Newsweek. Today's guest is Dr. Hannah Sargent, a research fellow at Space Park Lester. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Sargent. Great, thank you very much. So the premise here is that we're gonna have to find resources on the moon to eventually build an outpost to get to Mars eventually. That's, that's a general premise? Yeah, so um, there's a kind of general consensus that, uh, amongst the, the space community around the world that when it comes to human space exploration, we want to go to the surface of the moon for longer duration missions. And then we also want to use that as a sort of launch pad to take us onwards to Mars and just to expand um, sort of humanity's presence within the, within the solar system. Um, but in order to do that, it's really hard to um, to bring everything we need from Earth, right? It's it, That's a lot of rockets. It's a lot of money. It's just not a very sustainable approach to exploration. So what we want to be able to do is generate the materials and the resources that we need m more locally to where we are um, in space. Um, so on the moon, that means yet yeah, generating building materials or power or propellants uh, and all sorts of things. Um, and then we can use that as almost uh, a test bed as well for generating similar materials and similar resources once we get to Mars. So we can actually use the moon as a sort of a practice ground for, for some of that as well. And then as you alluded to the cost of all this, um, some pe people are telling me that a potential Mars mission could, could go into a trillion dollars. I think it would be highly necessary to spend hundreds of billions to get people to Mars and safely return them. It's hard to put a price on, on the science that can be returned, um, but what we find is that investment in space always results in such a positive financial return terrestrially in terms of the tech development. So when we develop technology for space, um, we always end up with um, useful products in realms that we can't even imagine um, or ever conceive of thanks to you know, things that we've, we've designed for the space station. They can help the medical industry, they can help the telecommunications industry. Um, so actually, financially, it, it can pay off. And I think what is important to consider as well is the, the societal impact of sending people to another planet. It can just light a fire in people um, and an excitement and a passion for, for science and technology that I can't imagine. You know, I wasn't alive in the Apollo era. I can only dream of what that was like. Um, but it, you know, it, it changed the world. What potential mining or or sources could we extract potentially from Mars? There's different types of um, of resource utilization. You can use resources to support the active mission on the surface. You can right. generate resources to support future missions, or you could generate resources that could potentially have a financial benefit here on Earth. I think the latter is is a bit of a way off. So I think the priority will be using resources to support the actual mission ex itself. So generating oxygen to support the life support systems of the crew. I think one of the major uses of resources on any planetary surface like the Moon or Mars would be oxygen for rocket propellants. So you don't have to bring all of the fuel with you to the surface. You can actually generate rocket propellants on the planetary body, which can then help you to return home because propellant is such a huge, huge part of the mass of a mission. Um, so if you don't have to launch it all, then you're able to save a significant cost there. NASA's nominee to be the next administrator, Jared Isaacman, as you probably know, is a big proponent of Mars. Do you feel that that, if he's confirmed, that that may signal perhaps a shift for NASA as well, or at least a reinvigorated uh, mission, so to speak? Yeah, it's a tough one because often we see, I guess, external to, to the US, we, we can see how changing governments can lead to changing priorities within the space industry. And it's really hard when the space industry is reliant on really long lead times to develop programs and to develop missions. So if things you know fluctuate every few years, it's really hard to stay on that consistent path. So I think 
you know, having the ultimate goal of people on Mars is still part of the international community's ultimate goal, but it is really important to remember the key steps that are required to get there. You can't take shortcuts to do this sort of thing um, in, a meaning, in a meaningful way. Um, so I just hope that, um, that the programs that will ultimately lead to, you know, a base on Mars, not just people on Mars. I hope those programs are continued to be funded as well. How do you see space exploration in say 10 to 15 years? I mean, should people expect lunar bases and widespread commercial space travel? Well, I mean, we're already starting to see a huge impact um, of the commercial industry on space exploration, um, particularly um, with lunar exploration. So there's a lot of robotic missions to develop the technology and the capability of how to do aut autonomous landing. So landing without having a pilot on board. All of this will actually feed into the crewed exploration programs as well. So I think next 10 to 15 years, we're going to see a lot more lunar missions. We're going to see prototyping of technologies and demonstrating them in situ and demonstrating them on the surface. For example, we might do some 3D printing of some roads or some landing pads. We might do some extractions of critical resources and show that we can produce some propellant on the moon. We may have a single unit of, or single module of a base, perhaps. It may not be the sprawling village that we, or city that we hope to see one day, um, but it's, it's the beginning and achieving that is, is no trivial task. NASA could never have done it all on their own, right? This, do, we could never um, expect uh, space agencies to fund these programs, whether that be ESA, NASA, JAXA or whoever. We want to do it all. And in order to do that, we need we need help. Um, and so it's, it's actually a more um, economical solution for space agencies to simply pay for a ticket to send their scientific missions to these exciting places and to send their crew uh, rather than also building the rockets, building the landers. That's where the CLIPS program, the Commercial Lunar Payload Services program really is, is taking off uh, quite literally. Um, you know, NASA is investing in these companies so that they can ultimately just pay for a ride um, and they can really focus on the things that are mo more important to NASA, um, which is that science and exploration rather than the whole um, ecosystem and technology required to do so. What excites you about the next three to five years in space exploration? The prospect of crew returning to the surface of the moon. I think because it's something that I never got to experience and I've been so, so excited by everything that has come from the Apollo era. And I've been in the space industry now for about 10 years. It would be great to be part of be part of this industry when we have people back on the moon. It's gonna generate so much excitement from around the world. I mean, I love my job and I just love it when everyone else gets excited about space too. And it's moments like that that really get people interested.